Hey, how you doing? He is not here. He is woke. That sounds uh, kind of blasphemous, doesn't it? It's a terrible thing to say, but you know, it's one of three lies uh, people are saying these days about the risen Christ. I want to look at each of these three with you. Well, uh, it's Good Friday. We're celebrating uh, this as a holy day. And of course, Sunday will be Easter. We will celebrate that as a holy day. Um, I love them. I love holidays. I love celebration. Uh, But when celebration overrides meaning, or we're having celebration without meaning, uh, now it's become vain. Sort of like if it's my birthday and I'm having a party at my house, and you come over, and you don't even talk to me, it'd be like, uh, hey, hello, this is supposed to be about me, it's my birthday. Same thing here, really. I mean, uh, we we celebrated Christmas recently, now Good Friday, then Easter. These are pillars of our faith. The birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. I mean, uh, the, these are essential pillars of what we believe and what we live out. Uh, So the meaning of these holidays is also essential. I mean, uh, we're talking about the birth of Christ, the divinity of Christ. And when we talk about the birth of Christ, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, The angel said to Mary, he will overshadow you and what is formed in you will be holy. Unto us a child is born, he will be called mighty God, the divinity of Christ. Then Good Friday, we celebrate the atonement of Christ. When Jesus was looking ahead to his uh, execution, he said, Father, what should I say? Deliver me from this hour, but for this cause I came into the world. This is what it was all about, was his atoning work on the cross. And then, of course, the resurrection. I mean, Paul said it beautifully. If there is no resurrection of the dead, we are of all men the most miserable. The whole thing falls apart. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then that means, hey, he wasn't God. So these are these are foundational. We're, we're not celebrating nice ideas about nice stories. These are holy days remembering factual events that have eternal consequence. So at Easter, as with all holidays, if you lose clarity, you lose meaning. The message of Easter, he is risen. He is not here. He is risen. Some are basically saying today, well, he is not here. He's woke. So let's look at that among two other lies. The first lie I want to look at. He is inclusive. He is inclusive. Now, Jesus made a very plain statement when it came to his exclusivity. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Pretty exclusive. But there are plenty of influential people who misrepresent his words and thereby they misrepresent him by saying, well, he said that, but he didn't really mean that. So, for example, one of the most prominent influencers, I think, of all time, Oprah Winfrey, has gone on record saying very plainly, there are a million ways to God, and she identifies herself as a Christian. Yeah, I know, okay, most of us are not taking theological cues from Oprah Winfrey, but hey, plenty of believers will take theological cues from the bishops of their denominations. Well, back in 2009, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church said, and I quote, We who practice the Christian tradition understand Jesus as our vehicle to the divine. Problematic wording right there. But but for us to assume that God could not act in other ways is, I think, to put God in an awfully small box. That's a quote from, again, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church back in 2009. We're putting God in an awfully small box if we take Jesus, God incarnate, at his word when he said who he was and who he exclusively was. Now, let's let's get this straight, okay? Um, of course, he is inclusive in his invitation. <laughs> Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. If anyone comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty inclusive invitation. Um, but the terms are exclusive. The terms are exclusive. I am the way, the truth, 
the life. Now, look, the urgency of the early church doesn't make any sense at all, does it? If he was, as they say, inclusive in that sense. If there were many ways to God, why on earth would Jesus do what we are commemorating today? That makes no sense. As a matter of fact, what did he say to the Father? And rhetorically, he answered his own question when he asked it. If there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. Well, there wasn't. So no, the terms are not inclusive. They are exclusive. Why would he suffer and die if there was any other way to God? For that matter, why, why would the early believers suffer and die martyrdom if there were other ways to God? Why on earth was Peter so urgent on the day of Pentecost? He didn't say, repent, this is one of many ways to God. He said, this is it. You must be saved and there's no other way you can be saved. Good grief, when they were about to be put to death, all of the early martyrs would have said, hey, wait a minute, you know, there are plenty of ways to God. So if you don't like Jesus as the way, hey, we're sorry if we offended you, please don't light those fires. That's not what happened. Their urgency testifies to the exclusivity of Christ. So yes, his invitation is inclusive. His terms are exclusive. That's the first great lie. And the second is like unto it. He's not only inclusive, he is permissive. He is permissive. He's, he's really wonderful. He's an anything goes kind of a Messiah. You know, he uh, not only loves everyone, but he's pretty much cool with whatever we do as long as we don't verifiably hurt anyone. Therefore, since he loves everyone, he must be okay with everyone. And if he's okay with everyone, he's pretty much okay with what anyone is doing. Now, that's a redefinition not only of the nature of God, but of love itself. Now, this is one of the great common lies of today, that love is primarily about affection. Now, love will include affection. I love affection. I am on record as bragging that I am the best cuddler you could ever meet. I love affection, whether it's with people or with my wife, my family, or my dog. Affection is awesome. I love it. But that alone does not constitute love. Love is not just about being nice and warm and affectionate with all people. When love is just about affection, well then... Love makes anything okay. If you're affectionate with someone, you can live together outside of marriage. You can be openly gay. You can abuse drugs. Just be sure that you are being nice and caring because love makes it all okay. As a matter of fact, one of the most prominent uh, contemporary Christian artists of all time, an interview in which she said, well, you know, it's pretty simple to me. Jesus said to love God and love people, and that's pretty doing which is a very broad ethic because it pretty much gives carte blanche to anything as long as you're saying, well, I'm loving God and I'm loving people. Well, then anything goes. Now, what's the end result of that kind of thinking? Please consider this. If he is permissive, if he is like, hey, I love you, so I'm pretty much cool with whatever you're doing as long as you are not verifiably harming anyone, what does that mean? There's no consequences. There's no, whoa, there's no future danger. There is no future danger. Uh, in fact, some progressive voices are saying at Easter we should never even be talking about sin. For example, a progressive Christian youth minister named Anna Skate is on record as saying a few years back regarding Easter and children's ministry, quote, There is nothing inherent to these children's humanity from which they need to be saved. Hmm, the kids don't need to be saved. Therefore, an atonement theology of inborn corruption in need of redemption has no place in a conversation with kids about Easter. Did you catch that? Man, it's breathtaking. When we are teaching kids about Easter, a theology of inborn corruption, all have sinned, and atonement, the sacrifice was made as the punishment for our sins, it has no place in a conversation about Easter. That's like saying when the Titanic is going down, the discussion of lifeboats has no place whatsoever. That's absolutely irrelevant. For heaven's sakes, that's the only life-giving message that matters. Again, this is a pillar truth. What we are celebrating today is a death because of sin. Let's make no mistake about that. If God was permissive about sin, there would have been no need for everything we are discussing today when we discuss the cross. If God is okay with sin, there would have never been the crucifixion of the Son of God. He died because of our sins, 
for the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. He lives to make intercession for us because of sin. Hebrews 7.25, we have a great high priest interceding for us. Why do we need intercession? Because even as born-again believers, we sin. And he has commissioned us to preach the gospel because of sin. Go into all ye the ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. For heaven's sake, why do that if God is permissive, if Jesus is permissive? Because hey, if we've all got amnesty, there is no reason to go out and talk about people needing to be converted. Why should they? And finally, a third lie, a very common one. He is woke. Jesus is the great woke persona. Now, woke, I know that's a very generic term. In essence, its usage means someone who is awakened to a new understanding of justice. Wherever you see woke policies, woke philosophy, you're seeing an awakening woke to a new understanding of justice. And so the new woke Jesus, he's all about reaching the marginalized. You know, he hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners of all kinds. So he reaches the marginalized. That's who he goes to. And he's all about social justice. He's all about overturning the halls of power, speaking truth to power, and and basically bringing about equity to everyone. He cares for the poor, for the oppressed. He elevates people. Therefore, he is the first and great woke. Um, Okay. As with most lies, there are elements of truth to it. Jesus absolutely went to the marginalized, didn't he? He did hang out with tax collectors and with prostitutes and and really with with anybody from the Pharisee to you know the the notorious uh, scandalous woman. So yeah, he did engage with the marginalized, and absolutely he did care, does care about social justice. Let's not get so unwoke, so reactive to that. That, that we're coming across as if, um, you know, poverty means nothing to us. Uh, people's well-being means nothing to us. It means a great deal, uh, as, as it did to him. But here's a key point about him. He came to solve the problem, not the symptom. Everything we are seeing by way of social injustice is a symptom of the great problem of sin. If you don't resolve the problem of sin, forget about resolving social injustice. The son of man, he said of himself, is come to seek and save that which was lost, not he has come to seek and reform that which was lost. There is no earthly paradise as long as there is earthly sin. As a matter of fact, what happened as soon as sin entered the environment, God pronounced the curse to Adam and Eve. They were expelled from the garden. And what did he do? He set up an angelic blockade. Why? Because he said, I don't want humanity to come back here, eat of the tree of life life, and live forever in their current state. No way are we going to have the garden if we don't get rid of sin first. Because if you try to, to, to keep man permanently in a sinful state and try to improve his environment, all you're creating is eternal corruption. His purpose was not to improve life. His mission was to give life. Now, you take sin salvation and the resurrection out of this equation you've got something i don't know what it is but it's not christianity it is only something thinly disguised passing itself off as christianity but what it is in fact is a golden calf an idol made in the image of something people can better relate to nice attractive easily accessed and perhaps most important one which requires nothing of you. Does Jesus require anything of us other than to believe on him? Well, no, when it comes to salvation, but yes, when it comes to discipleship, he requires, well, nothing short of you dying. Side point, but an important one, let's not celebrate Good Friday without considering our own death. This is not just about his death. This is about our identifying with him in that. So the truth is he is not woke but he is risen. We, likewise, are not woke, but praise God, we have been awakened, haven't we? I hope you have yourself a meaningful Good Friday and a wonderful Easter celebration. If you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast, won't you please uh, take a minute to hit that bell? Let me know you've subscribed. I'd like to thank you personally for that. You have any suggestions for future shows? I would love to hear from you. Also, if you'd like to support this work, just go to joedallas.com slash giving, joedallas.com slash giving, and that'll show you how you can partner with us. 
Well, this is Christians in the Cancel Culture. We're here every Friday. I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Meanwhile, let's remember what Paul said to Timothy about our job description. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be patient to all, apt to teach. Gentle to all, I should say, apt to teach. Patient in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if perhaps God will grant them repentance according to the knowledge of the truth. So relevant today, isn't it, when it comes to the truth? No, it is not just where you stand. It is also how you stand. Hey, thank you for being here. God bless you.